The Unfinished Swan invites us to view it as a fairy tale. A fairy tale in a children's storybook. Everything from the architecture, to the voice kingdom, acting, the to the magical elements, to the literal storybook pages reinforces this. The presentation does not just serve aesthetic value, but serves to treat the players as children. Not in a condescending or patronizing way, but in an inspiring way. The game is a call to action for all generations to do better than the last, and specifically, to make better art, and completely trample over all previous art in that pursuit. Throughout the first two chapters, playing as a young boy named Monroe, you desecrate the major artistic achievements of a king. In the first chapter, you merely reveal a white, imperceptible kingdom by coating it in black paint. By most regards, this isn't even a desecration of art, but a commemoration and showcase of it. The king has hidden it away, seemingly out of petty selfishness, but you are able to bring its apparent beauty back. And it is beautiful. The architecture is well designed, and the natural outdoor areas look lovely as well. But, crucially, coating the entire world with your black paint renders it equally imperceptible. It is only through the mediation of black and white colors that the true shape of the world is revealed. The new merges with the old to find something of value. In the second chapter, you find yourself letting vines grow wildly across a vivid and gorgeous city. The king resents these vines for obstructing his work and growing without reason or purpose. In his attempts to confine the growth, he creates something much worse, which we'll come back to. Anyway, you unleash vegetation on the city, and it twists and coils every which way. This unleashing of something foreign and wild onto the landscape of the city opens up new pathways for you to travel through. The act of taking a static, finished work and just letting loose on it brings about all kinds of new perspectives and understandings of that art. Except, of course, nothing in this game is finished, especially not the titular swan. During the second chapter, you learn that the king used paint thinner, malice, and snot to create a creature that could destroy the vines. But this creature, born out of nothing but spite and resentment, ends up being his downfall. In the third and final chapter, you explore the island on which the king resides, which is covered in the eternal darkness that stems from the creature. You learn that the king decided to pursue the construction of a massive monument of himself, but his magical powers soon faded, and he became trapped, asleep, in his own dream. Art, born out of joy, playfulness, or fervent creative energy, like the black paint on the White Kingdom or the vines in the city, is celebrated. Even art born out of narcissism or egotism is tolerated. But art born purely out of malice only devours the art itself and renders it completely worthless. But, as I said, no art is ever really finished. The king abandons both his kingdom and his city before they're finished. He is unable to finish the monument of himself. Even the seemingly complete gifts he creates for his wife are in a sense unfinished, as she fails to accept them. Well, aside from a paintbrush, which is a tool for further creation. And the king is never able to finish another painting after his wife leaves him. People, or characters as they're known in fiction, can be unfinished as well. The game straight out says that Monroe, a child, is unfinished. And it's fair to assume that even the king, at the very end of his life, remains unfinished. And of course, there's the titular swan. Always unfinished, and always just out of your reach. Until... At the end of the game, the king dreams of his entire body of work laid out in front of him. He sees all the defacement brought upon it and is disgusted. But then something happens. He arrives at his funeral, and the only person there is Monroe, who I should mention is also the king's son. And the king becomes Monroe, standing over his, the king's, corpse. Then, as he approaches the unfinished monument, 
he grows to match its size and knocks it down. The king admits that he, just like Monroe, painted over the art that existed before his own, and he gradually comes to accept that all his own art will eventually fade away. He reflects on the time spent working on it, and realizes that he enjoyed the process of making art. After realizing that, the king decides that it doesn't matter if it all comes tumbling down. And with that, the only thing left for him to do is give his paintbrush to Monroe. As Monroe leaves his father, he tells Monroe, rather candidly, None of this will last for long. And with the tool of creation passed down, you can finish what they started before, so long as you allow yourself to be knocked down too. The king wanted his work to last forever, but it never could, and it never should. Posterity can build upon, outdo, and even supplant all previous art, but it still needs that art to have existed and been something meaningful. The relationship between old and new art is codependent. The old demands the new to improve upon it, and the new needs the old to have existed so it can surpass it. Not only does new blood need to paint over the old guard, but the old guard needs to be willing to hand over the brush. The king finally does, and so Monroe can finish his mother's swan. And then the storybook closes, because the only way to tell this story is to tell it to children, whether literal or otherwise. The stories we tell our children are important. So, the unfinished swan tells us, the children, to transcend our parents. Every good fairy tale has a message, and perhaps the best messages must be contained within fairy tales.